Uh, these are some of, uh, you know, not to play favorites, but my favorite people in our ecosystem. <laughs> It's, it's true. Um, so we've got uh, Christopher Thomas, Jonathan Doten, Marty Belcher, and we're going to be talking about uh, a beautiful combination of modern art, history, science fiction, uh, and the way that we are using all of that to, in documenting and authenticating history in Web3. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our final panel today. Uh, so Web3 tools can really capture, authenticate, and store our most sensitive digital records, including testimony and documentation about human rights violations and war crimes. Today I'm joined by three individuals who are on the front lines of these efforts to preserve these vital records and tell some difficult stories, all in the name of advocating for human rights. Uh, so Jonathan Doughton leads the Starling Lab, which is a project of Stanford and USC that uses Web3 tools to preserve uh, many different important documents, um, but including 55,000 video testimonies of genocide survivors. Um, and then next, I'd like to introduce on our screen Christopher Coolindren Thomas. In his new film installation, uh, he is responding to the censorship of the Tamil diaspora following the violent end of the Sri Lankan civil war and really imagining a world beyond nation states uh, empowered by a new internet that is owned and built by its users. So always really excited to, uh, to see you, Christopher. Thanks for being here. Uh, and we're also joined by Nitherson Nanthakumar, who's a journalist and a community organizer uh, who, since the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War in 2009, has been working with communities around the world um, to help coordinate um, uh, there. So I want to start by diving in uh, with Jonathan. You know, starting with Web 2, um, there was a certain, I think, naivete at one point in time uh, about how the internet was going to solve human rights and international issues. Um, and sort of a belief in the early days of the web that information was going to be widely available and that um, that would in turn increase transparency and accountability. Um, and I think there's some, some question as to whether that has ended up actually happening. Um, so now that we have an opportunity to reflect on what we learned in Web 2.0 um, and improve on that with Web 3.0 and decentralized technologies, I'd love to hear from you what are the lessons that we should take from Web 2 and carry over to Web 3? Well, that's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to be here and really excited to have this conversation at South by Southwest. This is such an amazing event and it's really dynamic. And if you think about it, this was also one of the places we really reached like peak web 2.0, right? Like this is Twitter was released here at South by Southwest to great acclaim. And there was this belief like with those types of technologies that the availability of information would somehow liberate people. And, and there's a lot of wisdom in that, obviously. However, that's not the full story. And if you think about it, 11 years ago, the political movement and moment that really defined web 2.0 was the Arab Spring. And if you take the enthusiasm and the optimism of Tahrir Square, which the revolution that unfolded there was often called the Facebook revolution, you know, think about how naive we were about what was going to happen just because we all had Facebook to organize. We literally thought that Facebook alone would take down dictators. And that didn't happen. And if you go from the optimism of Tahrir all the way to the killing fields, of Aleppo and the crisis in Syria that is still ongoing today, I think you have a microcosm of all of the hope, which is important, but then all of the problems. And 11 years later, we now know better. And here's the things that we know that we have to do better on. One is that transparency is important, but it also can prove to be a problem when too much information is devolved. When you centralize the storage of information, you create a tremendous amount of vulnerability and also you create censorship opportunities. So the point is that we have to now use a lot of the lessons that we've learned from Web 2.0 and apply them to the even harder architecture of Web 3. And we can't enter into this with just euphoria. We have to be really smart and make hard decisions. And so um, my takeaway 
and we'll get into some of the specifics of what we're doing, is that we have to be very honest and we have to, to talk about the pros and the cons. And I think that's what's fun about these discussions today is that it's, we, don't, we need the idealism and the hope, but we also need reality as well. And so I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about the Starling Lab, uh, which you launched um, about a year ago um, and is, is really, I think, one of the most important projects in this space already. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the Starling Lab is based at Stanford and at USC. And our goal is to use Web3 technologies to help advance the domains of history, law, and journalism. And these new technologies hold tremendous promise, but then there's also risks involved. And so what we want to do is work with practitioners to understand how we can deploy safely these technologies in the field and learn a bunch. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, something that we're very proud to announce today is that we've appointed eight fellows to our journalism program. And these are some incredible journalists that are now using Web3 technologies to deepen their reporting. So for example, they're using authenticated photography to prove that photos and images have not been manipulated. Um, they are working on a variety of cryptographic tools to do fact checking and audio preservation and long-term archiving. We're going back to the 2020 uh, BLM protests and we're taking testimonies from photographers with lived experience who documented those protests and really changed the face of journalism. And we're preserving those records and thinking about how to protect that really critical piece of history. So that's just one example of you know, journalism as a domain that is no question it's going to be transformed by Web3, right? Just the same way that journalism was transformed by Web2. And what we want to do now is work with journalists to help change the technology roadmap. We want journalists to have a foothold at the very beginning so that they can influence what types of changes are made at the protocol levels and all the way up to the apps as well. Well, I'm so excited that you're announcing that today. That's phenomenal. Um, I think two, two questions here. I think one is I'd, I'd love to, for you to elaborate on the type of information and records that are part of this collection. And, and then given the sensitivity of the records that you're handling, obviously these require a high level of trust and verification. So how are you using Web3 tools to create and preserve that digital trust? Well, the very first thing that we are doing is we are establishing a root of trust as close to the source as possible. So that means that with your mobile phone, when you take a photograph, as an example, we are sealing the photograph and also metadata, like the time and the place. And if the photographer chooses, this is very important, to capture all of that information and then seal it, they can then distribute it elsewhere um, and prove that they have not manipulated anything that happens with that photo from that point forward. So that's a really powerful idea is preserving um, information at source. Then as you get to storage, we're working on ways of maintaining privacy and um, content moderation with cryptographic storage so that we know that information can persist, but that it's held very closely with community and that there's incentives to keep that information around. Um, the parable I think about is the Library of Alexandria. Um, the myth is that it was destroyed by a fire, and that's simply not true. Um, there was some fires that weren't helpful, but the reason that it disappeared was because of neglect. They ran out of money. <laughs> People stopped actually preserving those records, and then they turned to dust, and we lost a really critical part of humanity's knowledge. So when we think about archiving, we have to think for the long term and to create the right protocols and incentives for that. And then finally, verification is really important. Cryptography can help preserve not only the evidence itself or the object itself, but also as people come to interpret, provide context, evaluate information, those attestations, they can also be added to those records. And so that's how we think about it. We capture, we store, and we verify. And it doesn't matter what we do, whether you're a journalist or a lawyer or you're a historian, you actually go through the same set of steps. And that's how we came through this framework and started to deploy it all over the world. Thanks, Jonathan. So we're at this very uh, particular moment in time uh, with Russia having invaded Ukraine and just the absolute horrors there. Um, I've been, as a Ukrainian American, completely horrified by what's been going on the ground there. Um, can you talk a little bit about your work uh, on, on, in this space? I'm really, um, it's the first time hearing of this, so that's, that's really, that cuts deep. Um, I, I think we are living in an unprecedented moment of history here. And 
the effects of this conflict are going to be multi-generational. And sadly, at the lab, we were essentially prepared to do some of this work. Um, we began our work on legal accountability and trying to preserve documents and observations that could be admissible into court, specifically those documentations of war crimes, in Syria. And we did this in partnership with an incredible social enterprise called Hala Systems. And with Hala, we were able to advise them on how to actually take documentation in the field and to preserve it in such a way that it could be used to actually prosecute people for war crimes uh, in domestic courts in Europe as well as potentially in international mechanisms. And why cryptography is so important, it can do two things. One, it can authenticate the evidence so that we know that as people are collecting records and they're trying to create ways of establishing a chain of custody that it hasn't been manipulated from the field all the way to the courtroom, cryptography can help there. The other thing, and this is really important, cryptography can help give control and privacy to the investigators and also the documenters of this evidence. And I think we learned this the hard way. If you think about the Syrian conflict, so much of the information there was actually uploaded onto YouTube. There's this incredible statistic, Marta, that actually Google estimates that the number of hours of footage from Syria that is uploaded to YouTube there's more hours of footage there than there are hours of the war itself. So there's this abundance of information. And yet, YouTube was the one that was making the decision as to whether or not those videos should remain on YouTube or if they should be destroyed. And their intentions, if we take them, let's say, as genuine, they were like, look, this is really disturbing content. We can't have it be up. But then, inadvertently, they were actually destroying critical pieces of evidence that could be used for accountability. So we've learned a lot of things since that conflict. And now in, in Ukraine, um, the brave people at Hala Systems have stood up with our team. And I basically took our entire tech team and I took them off all of our work. And for the last 14 days, they have stood up the most incredible system to actually do end-to-end -end authentication of records in Ukraine. These will be on the ground observations that are going to be taken by civilians. Social media observations are going to be taken in as well from Telegram and from WhatsApp. And hopefully more and more people there use Signal, which is probably the only secure platform. And we're creating ways of establishing consent, locking in records, and then storing them for long-term preservation. And, and here's the incredible thing. I mean, it's a, it's a, we're using all these different Web3 tools that we, we didn't actually have before. So we're registering things on chain, we're minting NFTs, we're using proofs of space time with things like Filecoin and IPFS. All of those protocols are coming together. And our effort is not a short-term effort. If justice comes, and I really hope it does come in Ukraine, it is gonna take years and years. So that means this is a marathon and we need to think about how Web3 is actually going to be resilient and how we're going to raise both money and the resources to make sure that this documentation can withstand the test of time. And that's why this authenticity is so important. The people that are taking these documents in the field, they won't be able to necessarily be there in court. We won't be able to cross-examine them. They may not be alive. So we need to use new technologies to help preserve this evidence that we have the best chance of holding the war criminals that are already there. We want to stop them and potentially deter them as fast as we can. Jonathan, thank you so much for your work. Uh, really, uh, truly, truly astonishing and incredible. Um, I want to shift to talking, Christopher, about your work um, and the art you are making in this space. Um, so your latest film is a subject that has really deep personal ties for you. And while uh, it is fictional, um, it's based on extensive historical research. So could you tell us about your film and the research that went into it? Yeah, hey, and it's, uh, it's really great to be here, at least, at least remotely. Uh, thank you for keeping those two empty chairs for Nivison and I. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, both Nivison and I are part of uh, the uh, diaspora of um, the place that kind of no longer exists, and that the, uh, the ancient uh, Tamil homeland of Elam was wiped out in 2001 with the brutal end of the Sri Lankan civil war. And in the decades preceding that, 
Elam, which is in the north and east of what is today Sri Lanka, had been self-governed as a de facto autonomous state uh, with its own health care, education, justice systems and so on. And it was a pretty interesting, albeit ultimately failed, uh, experiment in building a kind of uh, pluralist society based on collective ownership. Now, that liberation movement was also probably the first of its uh, kind back in the early days of the World Wide Web to see the potential of the internet to circumvent censorship and bypass the Sri Lankan government's uh, control of media on the island. But when that revolution was wiped out, so was its quite remarkable uh, but short-lived history, because of course the winners of that conflict got to write that history. And that's really the subject of the film installation I'm working on now, with the support of the Filecoin Foundation. And uh, together with my uh, collaborator, Annika Kuhlman, and our, our extended family of long-term collaborators. And it's based on some of the ongoing research that Nitherson and his collaborators uh, have been doing for a while now. And I know you'll hear about that from him uh, shortly. So, you know, I, I think everyone is sort of familiar with this concept of uh, the winners writing the history books. And so really for you, your project is about uh, the losing side and, and telling, telling that story. And so why do you think it's so important to capture and preserve and share those stories? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can talk about that personally. Uh, for me, um, growing up as an Elam Tamil in the West was about synthesizing these kind of alternate realities. Because you grow up sort of knowing about um, this liberation movement back home, back when such liberation movements around the world were, were applauded in the West for uh, resisting oppressive regimes. And then, uh, and then with, the, with the so-called war on terror, those, <laughs> those same liberation movements uh, were relabeled as terrorists and condemned for undermining the integrity of the nation states from which they uh, sort of independent, right? And so then you're suddenly like called a terrorist and you have to synthesize these very different views of the same history. And I think, um, I think you end up with a kind of like healthy skepticism of, um, or at least an awareness of how stories are told. And I feel like it's much harder for people whose only frame of reference is from within the West to understand their worldview as only one possible version of reality. Right? And that, I think, can be dangerous because when you think that one view of the world is the only legitimate history, that can very easily lead to conviction for imposing that view on others. And I think that's the basis of imperialism. And I think what's so kind of like valuable, so precious about these, uh, these kind of lost histories that didn't get to play out, um, like that of the de facto state of Tamalilum, is that they're like sci-fi. They're, they're ways of glimpsing alternate realities, like other possible worlds. And I think that's, yeah, for me that's, um, but that's kind of part of the importance of, of, uh, of preserving these uh, like histories that haven't been properly recorded. Yeah, and, and so, you know, one of the things that's so striking, I think, about your art is how you think about technology, and specifically how you think about um, decentralized technologies and a decentralized future. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how you think about technology as it relates to your art? Yeah, I mean, the work I do is always um, collaborative, and uh, a lot of it is made through various automated processes, from GANs to natural language processing to uh, deep fakes. And um, I particularly want to mention another long-term collaborator, Jan Peter Giesking, um, with whom I've been kind of thinking through the idea that perhaps we had never even been human. In that when we use that word human, we usually mean, I think, more than the kind of biological like definition of our species, right? We're usually referring to a particular idea of what it means to be human. A particular idea from the West that was concretized into the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and that's kind of formed the basis of uh, a sort of globalizing juridical framework through which 
geopolitical conflicts around the world are negotiated as moral issues. And so that particular kind of definition of what it means to be human has become, I think, the kind of ideological front line of an empire. And it's maintained this sort of post-World War II liberal democratic world order. But that world order might now be unraveling in multiple regions. And I'm particularly um, interested in what happens to uh, these kind of values through a potential shift from the like universalizing social media platforms of Web2 with, um, I would say, uh, kind of individualistic advertising-based business models to the perhaps more um, pluralist ecosystems of Web3 with their more perhaps fragmented models of collective ownership. Now the film that I mentioned, the one that like Bad Roses and I are working on now, the film sees the potential of the internet through the prism of the Tamil Revolution in the mid-90s. And uh, when the island got its first internet service provider in 1995, the Sri Lankan government didn't know how to control the internet. So in the early years of the World Wide Web, the, uh, the Tamil Liberation Movement used the internet to coordinate a globally distributed economic system amongst the Tamil diaspora. And you know, they had their own like identity protocol and tax system, and it was like the beginnings of a network state. And the plan was to progressively decentralize what had begun as a kind of command and control military revolution into ultimately a sort of decentralized cooperative economy. Um, so it would be sort of based on computational coordination and collective ownership. Now, I have to say, these political ambitions were totally eclipsed by the realities of what ended up being a very bitter military struggle. And they were never conquered. But at least early on, the revolution imagined a different internet to the one that was being built in Silicon Valley at the time. And so the film I'm working on is really a kind of sci-fi about Web3, but told through the prism of how this particular liberation movement saw the potential of Web1. Thanks for that, Christopher. And, and this is a particularly, I think, uh, special panel because, uh, Christopher, you and Nitherson have recently teamed up with Jonathan and this, the team at Starling Lab to preserve some of that research behind this film and the other archives that are related. Um, so Nitherson, could you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing and the challenges that you faced in archiving that research through centralized platforms? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when the war in Sri Lanka or in Ulam ended uh, in 2009, I was like 16 years old. And at that time, I, my generation was politicized because of this massacre. And um, when we wanted to get political, um, we had like a very uh, chaotic situation here in the diaspora because when the moon was crushed, all the affiliated organizations in the diaspora were in the chaos and they had like internal fightings. And so there was not, not an, uh, there was not a front or an organization where we could join at that time. So the only thing which we could do at the time was like to start to collect evidence of the genocide of 2009 and also like um, starting to collect information and narratives from the Tamil side. And we did that through, uh, through um, searching people who have survived the genocide and who had the material who were spread around the world. We had to visit them and convince them that we are trustworthy and then got the material. And that process is still going on <laughs> because we are really spread around the world and we just have like uh, reached the people here in Europe. And then when we wanted to release these materials, uh, we faced like censorship, um, especially like on social media platforms like Facebook or Instagram, where they banned our accounts. And even there were like other incidents where um, Instagram was banning like hashtags of Ulam or hashtag of Tamla of Ulam. And these are things which were like a huge problem for us for two reasons. First, I mean, um, it was like a huge um, 
obstacle for us to move this work forward. And also like because the Tamil community is uh, uh, spread around the world and the globe, uh, we need the social medias to interact with each other. So when they were uh, doing the censorship and blocking our accounts, we lost sometimes the connections with other people. And when these things started to happen, we had to adapt to the situation and we started to release this information on other platforms like through books or we were doing like events or online events where we were presenting these materials and were distributing it to the people directly. So, you know, how do you think about uh, Web3 and how could your work with the Starling Lab change the way that you're thinking about preserving this information? Yeah, I think when, when we were, when you as an organization faced that challenge with the uh, online censorship, uh, we were like a bit not this, um, this moment, uh, this, um, we weren't like we haven't like stopped to move forward, but it was like a, it was like a force or a blockade which was like uh, hindering our work because we always had to think about how we are going to share it or how we are going to do it and how we are going to put up uh, resistance against these big tech companies and the state which are working with them and how we are going to preserve all this material. And when I see and hear about Web3, it just gives like, like, um, like a, a way to deal with the situation and not being completely helpless and, and you know, and to prove that it was really a genocide attack. So Jonathan, uh, on the Starling Lab side of things, could you give us a picture of what this looks like? Sure. So. Um, one of the very first things that we're doing together in this collaboration is we're helping the team encrypt their files. Um, and I'm going to embarrass Marta a little bit. So she's been on the forefront of actually fighting for the right for people to actually do that, to have really advanced tools to actually encrypt their files. And if you can't do that at the very beginning, then you really don't have any control over your information. And as you've heard, that type of control, if it's kept in the community, that is really where you get the most amount of wisdom because those are the affected parties. They have the lived experience to make the choices about curation. It's not some nameless, faceless kid that's sitting in you know, the bowels of like a, a building at YouTube. <laughs> They're completely inept in making that choice, right? So that's one of the powers of decentralization is that you can give agency through the network, but at its core, you have this ability to encrypt, which is a fundamental right that you then have that can persist. Um, I think the example here is very powerful and I want to just place it into context as we close, like with Ukraine as well. When governments enter in and seize territory, one of the very first things that they do is they destroy records. They destroy practical records around land registries and birth certificates and all that. It's a process of subjugating the populace and it's a process of delegitimizing those or um, those communities. And it's really important that obviously we take care of individuals now and the, the safety of, of refugees and, and, and people is obviously paramount, but those records are also something that we really need to be thinking about at the same time um, because they can have a long-term impact in terms of people's rights and what type of property that they can potentially maintain. But then also as um, Chris and, um, has shown in his work, it's also how you maintain your culture and the project of delegitimizing Ukraine has been a century-long process that is almost, you know, the similarities are eerie to the early Soviet days um, and how they basically tried to erase Ukrainian history. And so we're, we're thinking about those, those items as well. And, and it is, um, it's a very vulnerable moment because in one fell swoop, you're not just displacing a people, but you're also displacing their records. And so uh, that's part of why this is so important. We now have tools that give us a chance to do this type of preservation for accountability um, as well as, as for history. 
Yeah, that work is so important, Jonathan, and I am so grateful that you're doing it. Um, I want to get closing thoughts from all of you, um, and um, I'll start with uh, Nitherson, then go to Christopher, and then close with Jonathan. Nitherson, what are your closing thoughts here? Yeah, I think um, we have like a lot of challenges, especially from speaking from the Tamil community perspective. We have like a lot of challenges when it comes to like proof that it was a genocide and it's still a genocide that's going on. And using the new technology for it will be like very crucial and essential that we will have success in it. And yeah. And I think like there are also a lot of communities and other people who are in a similar situation who will need definitely a solution like us for this problem. Thank you. Christopher, I would love to get your closing thoughts. Yeah, I mean it's been it's um uh it's been really fulfilling um to be working with the Falcon Foundation over the last year. And uh and interesting uh, for me um, uh, to be working on uh, on this kind of like boundary between like fiction and uh, and and documented history, and um, and I've been really excited in the way that uh, that this new emergent collaboration uh, with Jonathan and Starling Lab has come about, and and. I'm very grateful to uh, to you all at Filecoin for for making that happen, um, and uh, and and for me, I think uh, it, it's interesting to be able to play out um, like different alternate like realities and fictions, and at the same time uh, um, uh, be involved in uh, in helping to uh, like document the the. Um, the historical record that it's based on. Thank you, Christopher. And it's been just phenomenal to get to work with you as well. Uh, Jonathan, I would love your closing thoughts. So thanks again um, for having me here. And I'm very happy to reach out to folks and have a discussion. The, the point of decentralization, it's meant to empower, right? And I think for those of us who are in the space, and there's probably many people here who are doing really awesome projects, um, I, I'll speak for maybe some of you in saying that I don't think it's been that easy over the last couple of weeks to talk about things like Web3. I can't tell you how many of my progressive friends, and I count myself as progressive in many ways, um, have just simply said, tried to kind of cancel the term, and there's, I think, a lot of cynicism that has come up. And the criticism is totally valid in many cases, right? There is fraud, there's a lot of insincerity, there's a lot of challenges around this space and making sure that we're not gonna be betrayed and duped kind of once again, you know, as technology, um, you know, turns from being this challenger to then, you know, being essentially an oppressor. But I think that this time we have a chance of walking into this conversation with a lot more uh, balance. And I want to make sure that we maintain the optimism as well. And that the criticisms we should take on and we should listen very closely because the grievances are, are reflecting something that's real. However, um, I just want to make sure that we also keep very hopeful because this is our chance to make a big difference with the, the infrastructure of our time. The internet is so crucial to preserve and, and we have to fight for that and we have to establish values that we can all come around. It's not just destroying and being cynical in a way. That's being clear-minded is a value. Being inspired is a value, and, and we need everyone to step up and do their part. Jonathan, uh, Christopher, and Netherson, um, I want to say thank you so much for being on this panel, but more importantly, thank you so much for your work.